بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أحسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار uh, So this is uh, lesson number 23 uh, The 23rd lesson in our series on the book by Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Taymi Rahimahullah Al-Ubudiyya with the commentary of Sheikh Salih Al-Fawzan So in the previous lessons uh, Shaykh al-Islam has been speaking about servitude, uh, the servitude of the heart to other than Allah, and how can that, how that can enter into material things, such as, you know, money, dinar, the dirham, gold, silver, uh, material things like fabrics, uh, luxurious cloth, luxuri- luxurious clothing. And things of that nature. So it shows that a heart can be attached to things on account of which it becomes angry and pleased, depending on whether a man or a woman acquires these things or not. So this is a danger for the heart of a believer in that its servitude to Allah can be compromised by way of physical material things and this all emanates from the from the tamar tamar meaning the you know the, the hope and the desire for something when when the heart starts desiring and wanting things right and this can be many things it can be leadership it can be wealth it can be status it can be a woman or a man right it can be you know and so the heart moves and desires these things and then it starts becoming you know enslaved to these things so Ibn Taymiyyah was speaking about all of this because the topic of this book is servitude servitude to Allah and the heart can be captivated and it can be enthralled and enslaved by other than Allah whether that is you know um you know something that is that is living like another another man another woman another servant of Allah azawajal or it can be material things like we mentioned uh, money gold silver uh, precious things like you know perhaps like you know uh, uh, luxurious clothing cars watches houses you know all of these types of things that that people's hearts become attached to. Now, following on from that was a point which is, what about rizq? What about seeking sustenance then? Because wouldn't this fall into the same category? And because this might cause confusion, then Ibn Taymi rahimullah, he went on to discuss this issue and he went on to explain that seeking rizq is something that should be sought from Allah Azawajal, that rizq is something that a servant is, you know, he, he by necessity he needs this thing, he needs food, he needs drink, he needs clothing, he needs shelter. This is by necessity and this is, you know, the nature of life. So he has to pursue these things and he has to have a desire. His, there must be a desire for these things in order for a person to, you know, survive. And so this does not enter into what we were discussing before, right? This does not enter into the heart being enslaved and captivated and in servitude to other than Allah, right? This does not enter into it. However, having said this, then in seeking his rizq, then a servant should seek it only from Allah Otherwise, even in this thing, 
then he falls into the danger of being needy and dependent and enslaved in essence to other than Allah. And that is if his heart becomes attached to other things in the issue of his rizq. So for example, when and so what we are speaking of here is when a person starts feeling as if someone should give to him. And you know, he starts having this desire in his heart of the people. They should give to me and I should ask them. Right? So this comes into the issue of Mas'ala, Al Mas'ala, which is asking other people, being dependent upon other people, having this expectation as if somebody else should come and give something to you. Right? So all of this now in the issue of rizq, this is something that um, can make a person fall into that same problem, you know, when it comes into the into the issue of rizq. So this is what uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymi rahimahullah was speaking about in the previous lesson. And we mentioned numerous ahadith from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu which basically uh, um, speaks of the humiliation and you know on the day of judgment uh, uh, and what will happen to a person's face the face will be disfigured and it, 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 it will have cuts and lacerations in his face if he was someone who would go and you know ask of the people and beg of the people and you know things of this nature so that's what we covered in the previous lesson and we, we spoke about uh, being independent and not being in need of other people and acquiring a skill and being honorable in the way that a person seeks his rizq and not to you know beg or ask or be dependent or needy on other people because that then leads your heart once again to be attached to other than Allah. And this is in an issue of rizq which naturally you know, our hearts, our souls are going to desire that because it's, it's something that we cannot do without. So this, even though it doesn't come into the the previous issue of, you know, when the heart desires leadership and, you know, uh, attachment to luxury and luxurious clothing and money and, you know, dinar, dirham and all the rest of it, that is a type of attachment to material things that is dangerous for the heart. Whereas here for rizq it is slightly different, it doesn't enter into that, even though there is still a danger if in pursuing rizq your heart becomes attached to other people. Right? So that tafsil, that detail uh, is what we clarified in the previous lesson. So continuing uh, from, from today, from today's lesson, uh, Ibn Taymi rahimahullah, he said, that قال الشيخ وقد ذلت النصوص على الأمر بمسألة الخالق والنهي عن مسألة المخلوق في غير موضع that when we look in the texts we find, we find the command to ask the creator and the prohibition of asking the created in more than one place so um, as uh, Sheikh Al-Fawzan explains upon this, he says that the book and the sunnah, the various texts, there are many texts which indicate the obligation of asking Allah Azawajal and being free of asking the people. So basically you ask Allah Azawajal whatever you need from Him, whatever you, whatever you are in need of, because this now is part and parcel of ubudiyah and to seek rescue from Allah to seek aid and assistance from Allah all of these are types of worship and from the perfection of that worship from the perfection of being in servitude to Allah is that you do not ask the people anything don't ask them ask anything of them but rather make your request and make your asking only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he is the one who will make easy for you the things that you need but as for the creatures, the creation um, you know, even if you were to ask the creation it's, and even though that might be permitted for you 
It's a type of humiliation. It's a type of lowliness. You know, so uh, it's disliked to ask someone else for something. As for Allah Zawajal, and also when you ask people, people dislike it as well. They feel, you know, as if there's a burden on their shoulders that when they get asked to give up something of their wealth or to, you know, they, 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 some people, it, it, uh, uh, um, they dislike that they should be asked. And so as for Allah Zawajal, then Allah Zawajal rejoices when he is asked. And that's why a poet he said uh, the following لا تسألن بني آدم حاجة وسل الذي أبوابه لا تحجب الله يغضب إن تركت سؤاله وبني آدم هنا يسأل يغضب يغضب uh, Do not ask the offspring of Adam the children of Adam for a need but rather ask the one whose doors are never closed off. The doors, uh, whose doors are never shut. Allah becomes angry if you abandon asking him. But as for Bani Adam, when you ask them, they become angry. Right? So this is some poetry to show that Allah Azawajal, he becomes angry when you do not ask him. Whereas the people become angry if you ask of them. And so this is the great difference between the creator and the created. And this is because the creator, he is the owner of everything. There's no end to his, you know, uh, dominion. There's no end to what he can give you of provision. Whereas the creature, the creation, you know, they, they don't really own anything truly. And they feel as if something is going to diminish from their property if they were to give something to you. This is the nature of people, this is the nature of men and women. Whereas Allah Zawajal, nothing is diminished from his kingdom, from his dominion, if you were to ask him and he was to give you. Nothing would be altered, nothing would be diminished you know, from his dominion. And so this is why the Shaykh goes on to say that, um, as we shall see from the speech of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah as well, that the Prophet ﷺ, he said to Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhuma, this is Ibn Abbas when he used to be young, he said, إِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ وَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتَ فَاسْتَعِمْ بِاللَّهِ That when you ask, then ask of Allah. And when you seek aid, then seek aid from Allah. So this is now some tarbiyah, some education, some nurturing, from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to a young man, you know, uh, Ibn Abbas when he was very young, to teach him that your heart should be attached to Allah Azza wa Jal. Ask only from Allah. Seek aid only from Allah. Don't let your heart to be attached to other people, expecting that they are going to help you, and that they are going to give to you, and that they are going to do everything for you, because... This is not a good type of, you know, this is not, this is, this is a person who is needy of people. This is a person who is dependent, is weak and lowly, right? And this the same thing should be said to even, uh, you know, the sons and the daughters as they are growing up. You know, they should be nurtured to uh, realize that by the time they hit maturity, which is, you know, 12, 13, 14, that they need to be independent. They need to be self-reliant and they need to be able to handle all of their own affairs, be able to feed themselves, be able to clothe themselves, be able to provide for themselves. Like around this age is the time, because remember here, Ibn Abbas, radiallahu uh, anhuma, Ibn Abbas here was a young, uh, he was basically uh, very young when this advice was given to him by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is also keeping in mind the fact that all those centuries ago, the age of maturity, uh, when boys and girls became men and women, was a lot younger than it is now. Uh, because, you know, by the age of nine, a girl would become a woman, and likewise, boys would become men, 
uh, around that age, around that same age or shortly thereafter, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13. Uh, there wasn't this distinction of all these, you know, th these are recent new things where basically you have like the teenage, teenage years and, and the youth and the, all of this. These are like social uh, things which, which appear in, in societies. But historically speaking, you are either a boy or a girl who turns into a man or a woman, right? And so here, uh, in, 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 in this case, we see from this tarbiyah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying to this young uh, boy, saying to him, إِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ وَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتَ فَاسْتَعِمْ بِاللَّهِ when you ask, ask only of Allah. And when you seek aid, seek it from Allah Azawajal, teaching him independence, self-reliance, to manage his own affairs, you know, to seek his livelihood, and to, you know, so on and so forth. So, um, likewise, the Shaykh goes on to say that uh, this is a tarbiyah for this uh, young man to make his atat to make his heart attached to Allah Azawajal and not to start looking at other people and what's in the hands of the people and to desire that and to expect and anticipate that they should give to him and you know and so on and so forth. And likewise the hadith that was mentioned in the previous lesson where the Messenger of Allah Sallam said that 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 one of you should go with his rope and he should go and collect firewood is better for him than that he should ask the people, you know, whether they give to him or do not give to him. So, in other words, it's better for you to take your fire, to take your rope, and go to the, you know, woods and to the trees and to the, you know, and, and to start gathering sticks and, and branches and collect it as firewood, then come to the market and sell it as firewood and earn a living that way rather than be needy of the people, expecting that the people should give to you. So this is the hadith of the Messenger of the Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as the Shaykh says, uh, a man should strive to be as free of need and free of want as much as he is able. Right? He should... Uh, avoid asking the people and be self-reliant as much as he is able. Because in all of this, there is honor and dignity for him. And, you know, that he should acquire a skill or that she, he should use his, his physical labor in order to earn something. And, you know, that, uh, that, that, that he does this is better for him than asking of the people. So coming back to the speech of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he said that in the, in the texts, in the Qur'an and the Sunnah, we find that there is a command to ask Allah Zawajal and the prohibition of being in need of the people. So Ibn Taymiyyah mentions a, a verse from the Qur'an, and so he says, mentions the ayah, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ وَإِلَى رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ Right, so this is in uh, Surah Al-Sharh, at the end of that surah. فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ So when you, this is addressed to the Messenger of Allah Wasallam, that when you finish from your preoccupation, when you finish from your worldly needs and your worldly preoccupations, فَانْصَبْ Which means then be dedicated and be fixated on your worship with prayer and with remembrance of Allah Zawajal and you know with obedience to Allah Zawajal. So here the meaning of fan sub here means that you should be dedicated in that until you become weary and tired while you are doing that. In other words, strive in your prayer strive in your obedience, strive in your remembrance to Allah Zawajal, strive in worship of Allah, in all of that up until to the degree that it starts to tire you and makes you, you know, uh, tired. And so we see as the Shaykh goes on to explain that many people what they do is that they use their spare time, they become preoccupied in 
uh, pastimes and fun and games and things which are not really, you know, uh, which are not really, um, it, it basically kills your time and it's not really truly beneficial for you. Rather that spare time that you have when you are not seeking your rizq, when you're not seeking your sustenance, when you're not engaged in, in the worldly preoccupations, that time should be used, um, you know, it's, um, it, 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 this time is precious, this time is golden, and it should not be used in, you know, pastimes and wasting it in useless things, like, that, like, like we see people do, you know, in, in games and pastimes and frivolities and things of that nature. Rather, the Sheikh says, it's befitting for a Muslim that he either use this time for his hereafter, for his hereafter, so he does things like we mentioned, dhikr, ibadah, and things of that nature, or he should use it to, you know, um, engage in skills and uh, professions and things that things that are going to improve his, his world and his dunya, and things which are practical and beneficial. And we know that there are certain things that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he recommended, you know, specifically things like archery and horse riding and, and, you know, things that come into this general category like swimming. And these are practical things uh, which are of benefit uh, to, to a person. Or he should be engaged in worship. You know, so in other words, everything from his time is useful and beneficial either in terms of the dunya or in terms of the hereafter right so basically he's trying to secure his worldly affairs or he is trying to secure his affairs of the hereafter and there's no time in between for frivolity and and things of that nature especially things that you know waste and preoccupy time then the sheikh goes on to comment wa ila rabbika farghab وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ And this now is the point of evidence. This, this is the verse which is our evidence. What does it mean? It means that, that here Allah Azawajal said, وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ The first point, well, first of all the general meaning is that you should be you know, aspiring to your Lord. Your aspirations should be with your Lord, meaning your needs and your wants and your aspirations should be towards your Lord. That's the general meaning. That's the first thing. And the second thing we find that the way the sentence has been constructed, it has been the order has been reversed. So whereas normally it should be Farghab ila Rabbik. Farghab ila Rabbik. So here we say, aspire, place your aspiration in your Lord. But we find that the order has been reversed. It is the other way around. It said, it, rather it, Allah Azawajal said, وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ So he made, وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ He put that first, and then he put the action second. So he said, and upon your Lord, Place your aspiration. And the meaning of this, when you do this in the Arabic language, when you bring something forward and you delay something after it, you know, when you reverse the order of the sentence, then the meaning of this is that this basically, the meaning comes, the meaning becomes that ask only from Allah, place your aspiration only in Allah, only in Allah. Place your aspiration, right? So the meaning is, place your aspiration only in Allah for that which is with Allah, right? Do not aspire in those besides Him. Do not put your aspirations and hopes and needs and wants in those other than Allah Azawajal. So this is basically the meaning. It's saying, put your aspiration only in Allah. And do not put it in those besides him. And so this is because of the construction of the sentence. This is what gives us this particular meaning. 
So after this, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah, he mentions the hadith of Ibn Abbas that we mentioned earlier on. إِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ وَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتَ فَاسْتَعِمْ بِاللَّهِ فَاسْتَعِمْ بِاللَّهِ And uh, Shaykh al-Fawzan says that this is because Allah Azawajal is al-ghani, al-hamid, al-ladhi indahu uh, hawa'ijuk. He is the all-praiseworthy, the, the one who is free of all need, and with him lies the fulfillment of all of your needs. So do not ask those besides him when it is Allah you know, who fulfills all your needs. And wasta'im billah, seek aid from Allah. And this was the advice as we said to Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma and obviously to everybody else as well that all of their needs and requests and seeking of aid should be directed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, then Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymi rahimullah he says, he brings another evidence, وَمِنْهُ قَوْلُ الْخَلِيلِ فَبَتَغُوا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ الرِّزْقَ He says also the statement of Ibrahim al-Khalil alayhi salam, who said, and seek with Allah sustenance. So once again, if you look at the wording and the structure of this verse, we see the same pattern. Let's go through it again. فَبْتَغُوا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ الرِّزْقَ So we see that the word rizq has been delayed and the the عِنْدَ the, اللَّهِ the, the part where it says عِنْدَ اللَّهِ it has been moved forward. So ordinarily speaking, normally this sentence should read فَبَتَغُوا الرِّزْقَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Seek sustenance with Allah. But it has been changed to bring عِنْدَ اللَّهِ forward and to delay الرِّزْقَ So now we see instead of فَبَتَغُوا الرِّزْقَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Instead of that it says فَبَتَغُوا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ الرِّزْقَ and so once again, the meaning of this in the Arabic language is basically to say, seek your sustenance only from Allah and do not seek it from anyone else. So this is now the construction of this sentence gives this particular meaning. And so this is what Ibn Taymi says that here he did not say, وَلَمْ يَقُلْ فَبَتَغُوا الرِّزْقَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ لِأَنَّ تَقْدِيمَ الظَّرْفِ يُشْئِرُ uh, بِالْإِخْتِسَاسِ وَالْحَسَرِ So he didn't say, you know, seek your sustenance with Allah. Rather he said, seek with Allah your sustenance, with the meaning of emphasis. And this is because to bring, you know, forward the uh, ظرف, then it gives the meaning of, you know, uh, uh, restriction and comprehensiveness, meaning that seek it only from Allah, none others. And it being restricted only to Allah, so therefore do not seek it from anyone besides Him. So, um, uh, and he says, كَأَنَّهُ قَالْ لَا تَبْتَغُوا الرِّزْقَ إِلَّا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ As if he is saying, do not seek your sustenance except with Allah. And likewise, وَقَدْ قَالَ تَعَالَى وَاسْأَلُوا اللَّهَ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ And ask Allah from His bounty. And ask Allah from his bounty. So these are some other verses that Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah, he mentions. And uh, Shaykh al-Fawzan again, he comments upon this. And basically he says the same thing uh, about the construction, uh, the structure of the sentence. So we don't need to repeat that again. Um, after this, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah, he goes on to say, وَالْإِنسَانُ لَا بُدَّ لَهُ مِنْ حُصُولِ مَا يَحْتَاجُ إِلَيْهِ مِنَ الرِّزْقِ وَنَحْوِهِ وَضَحْعِ مَا يَضُرُّهُ وَكِلَ الْأَمْرَيْنِ شُرِعَ لَهُ أَنْ يَكُونَ دُعَاءَهُ لِلَّهِ فَلَهُ أَنْ يَسْأَلَ اللَّهِ وَإِلَيْهِ يَشْتَقِي So this means that a man or a woman, it is vital and necessary that he, you know, acquires his needs, right? Obviously we have needs. And he needs 
sustenance and things which are like that, such as like food and drink and shelter and clothing and the likes. And likewise, he also is in need of repelling the things that harm him. So this is something that is by necessity, we need these things. We need the risk in order to survive. And we also need to repel the things which harm us. Now, both of these things, it is legislated that we make dua to Allah Zawajal for both of these things. That we ask Allah Zawajal and that we only complain to Allah in relation to these two things. So now we are entering another level of meaning, which is the issue of complaining and the issue of patience, right? So you need to understand the, you know, serial connection in all of these things that we are discussing. Remember that we, at the beginning, we were discussing about material things and how the heart can become attached to material things like money and clothing and luxuries and, you know, things of that nature and how this is a type of servitude to other than Allah, right? When the heart becomes attached to material things, this starts becoming a type of minor shirk, which is why the messenger of Allah Sallallahu you know, he said, you know, wretched or perish the worshipper of the dinar and perish the worshipper of the dirham, right? Because here what's happening is that when your heart becomes attached to these other things, there is a type of competition in the heart between the material things, right? The material things are competing in your heart with your heart being attached to Allah Azawajal. And so this now removes that perfection of ubudiyah to Allah. And so this now starts entering into the, the level of minor shirk. So after that, we then spoke about a rizq seeking sustenance and how seeking sustenance does not enter into uh, those other things when your heart becomes attached to material things. Because sustenance, a rizq, is something that by necessity you need. And your heart obviously is going to be attached to food and drink and, and you know, the essential clothing and the essential shelter, right? Your heart's going to be naturally attached to these things. So uh, this means that we can't treat a risk to be the same as those other things. However, in seeking risk, you seek it only from Allah Zawajal and you do not lower yourself, you do not humiliate yourself by, you know, having these expectations and aspirations being placed in people you know thinking that they should fulfill your needs and you begging them and asking them and being in need of them this now is a type of humiliation and the honorable thing to do is to ask from Allah Zawajal and to be independent self-reliant you know after you rely upon Allah Zawajal obviously and you seek a skill or you use your physical labor this is more honorable then that you should be begging the people to sweep the street and to clean the streets and to empty dustbins is more honorable than that you go around begging the people and asking of the people. So we mentioned all of that and now we enter into another level which is part and parcel of this whole thing which is that you obviously you ask only of Allah but there's another level to it which is that when you complain complain only to Allah, right? So not only is it, because there are two things that, that a person needs. A person needs his sustenance, his rizq, so he asks Allah, and inevitably he's going to come uh, into hardships and difficulties and trials and tribulations, and perhaps he will also be oppressed by others. So in that respect, he will need to make his complaint only to Allah. This now is a shakwa, a shakwa. When you make your complaint, then make it only to Allah. Do not complain to the people. Because once again, when you start complaining to the people, this now is a type of attachment to the people. In the same way that when you start asking and begging and, you know, expecting 
from the people that they should give to you and help you and feed you and clothe you and so on and so forth. This again is a type of uh, uh, attachment, your heart's attachment to the people, which again takes away from your enslavement to Allah Azawajal. So this now is like another level, uh, another half of the whole picture, which is the issue of complaint. And so that's why Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah says, فَلَهُ أَنْ يَسْأَلَ اللَّهِ وَإِلَيْهِ يَشْتَكِي So it is upon the servant to ask from Allah for his needs and to then complain to Allah only for whatever hardships and harms and difficulties that come his way. And the excellent example in this respect, the most excellent example in this respect from the Qur'an is the example of Ya'qub alayhi salam because um, you know he said Ya'qub alayhi salam he said qala innama ashku bathi wa huzni ila Allah he said indeed i complain of my you know he complained of his, of his difficulty and his grief to Allah innama ashku bathi wa huzni ila Allah as, as occurs in Surah Yusuf. And so, um, as uh, Sheikh Al Fawzan goes on to comment upon this, uh, he says that, commenting upon this passage, he says that a person is in need of his Lord because he is the faqir, he is the needy person. Ya ayyuhan nas, antumul fuqara ila Allah, wallahu huwa al ghaniyul hamid. O mankind, you are needy of Allah, and Allah is the one who is free of need, worthy of all praise. So a person is faqir, he is in need of Allah, and he is in need of the one who is going to aid him, and that can only be Allah Azza wa Jal. That can only be Allah Azza wa Jal. And so here, also in the issue of complaint, we see that Ya'qub alayhi salam, we know that uh, he was in grief because, you know, in, in his knowledge, he'd lost one son and then he lost another one because he was, you know, held captive in, in Egypt. And so the grief that he had, what did he say? Right, so on top of being patient, he also complained only to Allah, not to the creation. He did not complain to the creation, right? And so as we shall see, there is no contradiction between complaining only to Allah whilst at the same time being patient upon the calamity. Both of these things are, you know, the, to complain to Allah is something that is permissible and it, it, it uh, does not clash with having patience. So then, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymi rahimullah, he says how in the Qur'an, والله تعالى ذكر في القرآن الحجر الجميل والصفح الجميل والصبر الجميل. So in the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal has mentioned uh, three things. He's mentioned al-hajr al-jamil, which is when you uh, have a beautiful when you when you leave someone or something, you make hajr, you you abandon it, you leave it, and you do it in a beautiful way. And likewise, when you pardon someone, when you pardon someone and you do it in a beautiful way. And thirdly, when you have patience, a sabr, and you do it in a beautiful way, right? What do each of these three things mean? Because these three things have all been mentioned in the Quran. What is a beautiful emigration? What is a beautiful forgiveness and what is a beautiful patience what what are each of these things ibn taymiyyah rahimullah goes on to explain he said that it has been said al hajr al jamil inna al hajr al jamil huwa hajrun bila adha bila adha so when you when you leave uh, someone when you when you leave someone or you abandon someone um, and you do so, do so in a 
beautiful way. You do it in a way where you do not harm. You do not do not bring. A, you know, you do not cause harm, but you leave that person or that thing. So, for example, let's give an illustration. A man he abandons his wife uh, in the home because he's upset with her for a you know for a, for a valid reason amongst the valid Sharia reasons that he's allowed to uh, you know leave his uh, make hajar of his wife in the home. And he does so without doing any harm though. He doesn't like cause any harm, but he does so in a beautiful way. Right? Uh, he does it in a beautiful way. Right? So this is what the meaning is here. That, that when you make hajr, you do it in a beautiful way without inflicting any, any harm or doing any type of oppression. And then he says, وَصَفْحَ jamil is like the beautiful pardoning when you pardon someone. It means that you pardon someone, but without criticizing them and finding fault with them. Because if you criticize and find fault for what they've done, then really you are not really forgiving them or pardoning them. So the beautiful pardon is the one where you pardon them and you do not you know, criticize them or rebuke them or anything like this. Because now... This is like, it's a, it's a type of, you are nullifying or you are compromising your, your forgiveness of them, right? You are harming it, you are damaging it. Rather, the beautiful type of forgiveness is that you forgive whatever was done and you do not start criticizing and rebuking and, you know, because it, it kind of contradicts the, the whole notion and the whole spirit of, of uh, forgiveness. So this is what is called the beautiful forgiveness. And then the third thing, as-sabrul jameel, as-sabrul jameel, what is the beautiful patience? It is the patience in which you do not complain to anyone. You do not complain to any of the creation, right? This is the beautiful patience. And we've seen this clearly from Ya'qub alayhi salam when he said, إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ Indeed, I, I, you know, make my complaint uh, of my grief and my, uh, my, you know, my issue here to Allah, only to Allah. And likewise, it is related about Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, when he was ill, when Imam Ahmed was ill, it was mentioned to him that Tawus, Tawus, one of the early Salaf, that he would dislike that an ill person starts making these noises. You know when you are ill and you make this groaning and moaning and you make the sound of the pain and whatever else, the Tawus used to dislike this. And so when Imam Ahmad heard of this, then he, then Imam Ahmad never ever made a noise after that ever again, you know, until the day that he died. Right? Why is this? Because this is, it's kind of like a type of moaning. You are, you are complaining to the creation by making these sounds of, of pain, by moaning and groaning about the pain. This is a type of complaint to those people around you, to the creation. So all of this is undesirable. You know, you don't complain, you don't moan uh, to the creation, you don't bring your complaints to the creation. But if you want to bring a complaint and you want to, then you do it only to Allah So, this is why Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he says, وَأَمَّا الشَّكْوَى إِلَى الْخَالِقْ فَلَا تُنَافِيَ الصَّبْرَ الْجَمِيلِ فَإِنَّ يَعْقُوبْ قَالَ فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ وَقَالَ إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ So he says, so he says that, as for complaining to the Creator, then this does not clash and does not invalidate a sabrul jamil. So you can have beautiful patience. You can have beautiful patience. And because Yaqub al Islam, what did he say? Yaqub al Islam, he is the one who said uh, at the beginning of Surah Yusuf, he said, Fa sabrun jamil. Fa sabrun jamil. Right, this occurs at the beginning of Surah Yusuf, 
verse number 18. And then later on towards the end of the chapter, when we go through all of the story and, you know, he's filled with grief about his, about his sons, he then says, إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ He says, I complain, you know, of, of, of this issue and of, of my grief to Allah. So here there is no contradiction. Why? Because you are complaining only to Allah. And so, you know, by complaining to Allah, this is part and parcel of ibadah. Because to Allah, return all affairs. And you can complain to Allah of, you know, your hardships and whatever oppression you might be uh, facing and so on and so forth. Right? There's no, nothing wrong with this. And so alongside having patience, as long as you are not complaining to the creation, it's perfectly fine for you to complain to Allah Azawajal. And in this, this does not harm your patience whatsoever. And it is still beautiful patience. Right? Beautiful patience is that you do not complain to the creation and you, you know, remain patient, right? Without complaining to the creation. And you are free to complain to Allah Azawajal. This would not affect the patience. And likewise, um, Ibn Taymiyyah mentions how Umar bin al-Khattab, Umar bin al-Khattab, radiyallahu anhu, that whenever he used to read this uh, 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 chapter, this surah from the Quran, when he would when he would read Surah Yunus and Surah Yusuf and Surah An-Nahl in his you know in his prayer in uh, in the Fajr prayer, he would whenever he passed by this particular statement of Yaqub alayhi salam, he would uh, start crying, and you know his crying could be heard from the very last row. Whenever, whenever he would, you know, recite this particular statement, "Qala innama ashku bathi wa huzni ilallah." Indeed, I make my complaint of, of you know, my my difficulty and my grief to Allah Azza So Umar bin al-Khattab would cry whenever he heard of this. So Sheikh al-Fawzan he mentions that uh, ashkwa. Complaint is when you mention your need and this should only be to the Creator and um, because this is a type of worship in itself and it doesn't conflict with having patience and that's why Yaqub al-Islam said what he said. He said, for sabrun jameel in one place and he said in another place, innama ashku bathi wa huzni Allah. So all of this indicates that complaining to Allah does not clash with having uh, patience. And, you know, so uh, this is what uh, Sheikh Al-Fawzan mentions. And so we'll end at this point. We'll take up this uh, uh, this discussion, inshallah ta'ala. We'll end at this point uh, for today's lesson. Uh, and we finish on this note. So basically what we've uh, uh, introduced in today's lesson is that you know, there are multiple levels of this whole discussion of servitude to Allah and how this servitude to Allah, this ubudiya to Allah can be compromised in different ways. It can be compromised by the heart being physically attached to material things. It can also be compromised in the issue of rizq, in the issue of sustenance. When you start being, you know, when you start asking of the people, being needy upon the people, you know, having expectations of the people that they should give to you, they should look after you, and so on and so forth, right? This is another level of compromise in ubudiyah. And likewise, there is a third level, which is when you start complaining to other than Allah, your complaints are to the people, right? When, when people, uh, for example, you say, you know, you guys didn't help me and you didn't give to me and you didn't support me and you didn't and I was in need and you didn't this and you didn't that and all of this complaint to the creation. You should be complaining only to Allah because this once again shows that if you're complaining to the creation, it's as if you believe that they are the ones who fulfill your needs, whereas it is Allah who fulfills your needs. 
right? So your complaint should be to Allah Zawajal for any hardships, difficulties, calamities, oppression and the likes. Your complaint should only be to Allah. So pay attention to how servitude to Allah Zawajal, it can be it can be compromised or it can become imperfect by all of these different types of things wherein you know your heart or you uh, uh, you are placing you have this attachment to the creation right so all of these things should be avoided attachment to material things you know being self reliant uh, in you know independent in in your in your sustenance relying only upon Allah, not having needs and expectations of the people, being honorable in you know, pursuing your, your living and your sustenance, likewise complaining only to Allah Zawajal and not to other than Him from among the creation. All of this is connected to the issue of ubudiyah, being an abd of Allah, being a slave of Allah Zawajal. Right? All of this enters into the perfection of all of that. So we'll finish with that today inshallah ta'ala and we'll continue this discussion in the next lesson walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala nabina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in